Good morning, Catherine. My Good name morning. is My name is Mark DePew. I am here with Catherine Harris, who is the Director of Library Services for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. Today is October 9th, 19th, I'm sorry, Thursday. And Catherine, what I'd like to do, um, we're here to talk with Catherine about your experience growing up in Southern Illinois. And I think if there's a theme here, growing up black in white Southern Illinois, if you will, in Carbondale particularly. I'd like to start with a little bit of your parents' background. Not start with you, but your parents instead. Well, in all honesty, I really have not given a lot of thought to where my dad was born. I know that I have, um, I believe my dad must have been born in Carbondale or Southern Illinois somewhere because I know my grandmother always said she was from Macanda. So I assume that my dad was born somewhere in Southern Illinois as well. My mom was born in um, Illinois as well. You know, working here in the library, people often ask me if I've ever done my genealogy. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't. So I really can't answer those questions off the top. I think she was born in some place called Unionville, which is in southern Illinois, too. So well, One thing I'm always curious about is how, does, how did your family end up in southern Illinois? Do you know? As I said, my grandmother said she was born in Macanda, which is southern Illinois. My mom was born in southern Illinois. So I guess we've always, as far as I can recall, which is only one or two generations back, it's always been Illinois and Southern Illinois. Okay. And obviously your entire childhood was in Carbondale. Yes, all of it. Where did, where did you live in Carbondale? I lived at 413 East Green Street. Okay. And there's East Green Street. So pretty close to the downtown area. Yes. And where would your church have been? My church was on East Jackson Street. So just a couple of streets south of there. Right. Okay. Uh, what was the... Uh, I imagine even at that time that uh, Carbondale was predominantly a white community. Any idea of the percentage that the black community made up? I have no idea, but I do know this for a definite fact. I did not, I probably only knew one black person who lived west of the tracks in Carbondale. Her name was Miss McCracken, and she was a school teacher, and she lived on Pecan Street. And the dividing line or the separating line in Carbondale is, was, and will always be probably the railroad tracks. Okay. The black folks lived on the east side and the white folks lived on the west side and you when I was growing up. And you remember that distinctly because that was unique and there mm -hmm. was very clear divisions in everybody's mind that yes. that's the way Carbondale was working. Um, you are the sixth of ten? Yes, if there's a middle in ten. Yes, I'm the, I'm the sixth. Okay. Um, tell me just a little bit about your home then in Carbondale. The physical house or, yeah. or my home life? No, your physical house. We'll get to the home life here oh, soon okay. enough. Okay. You know, I, had, I have nine brothers and sisters. But at the time that I was growing up, there were hardly more, there, there, there were seldom more than five or six of us children at home at any one time. We had a three-bedroom house, one bathroom, and it was always, in hindsight, an amazement to me that we always got to school, to church, to work, or whatever on time with one bathroom, five or six <laughs> kids. Uh, my brothers were lucky because my oldest brother, right my brother right above me. I think he's like four or five years older than me. He was lucky because he had a room by himself because he was a boy. The girls. And no boys that were close to his age? At that time, yeah. when he was there. At, at the time, I had two other sisters, of course, living at home. And so the three of us shared a bedroom and we slept in bunk beds and I got to sleep at the top because I was the older, the oldest one. And then my mom and dad had a room. 
So were you girls jealous of your brother for having yes, his own room? Yes, because he had his own room. <laughs> and then when my youngest brother, who is now deceased, came along, he got to have the bedroom by himself. It's so. just it's just worked out that way, <laughs> didn't it? It just worked out that way. Now, some of your older siblings were born at the tail end of the Depression, appears to me, and then some of them and were in the you know, Second World War era, and then you came along right after the war. I mean, did, did that family order and where they, when they were born in America's history kind of affect things, you think? Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure that it probably did, and what was going on in the world probably helped to, sh helped to shape who they became but and he, who all of us became. Yeah. But even in the Depression, your father always had a good job. He had work, steady work. Uh, he had work. Let's not say he had a good job. Okay, okay. <laughs> My dad was a laborer okay. for the railroad. Well, let's talk a little bit about what your parents did for a living then. Okay. Um, as I said, my, my dad worked for the railroad. He was a laborer. And uh, the things that I remember about my dad and his work include him being gone to work before we even got up for school because he worked from like 7 to 3 something like that. So dad was always gone, headed to work like at 6.30 in the morning, which was around the time we would get up to go to school. Now, what did my dad do? I haven't a clue <laughs> what my dad did <laughs> as a laborer. I guess he did a wide variety of um, things having to do with the trains. He worked in the roundhouse. Okay. Um, and uh, toward the end of his... Um, working career at the Illinois Central Railroad in Carbondale, he did rise, maybe is the word, to the level of a brake man, and he worked on the brakes on the trains. So mm -hmm. my mother, on the other hand, um, she worked as a domestic for a while, cleaning white folks' houses. Mm -hmm. um, she worked as a cook. I remember um, her working for Tau Kappa Epsilon Fraternity as their chef, um, as, as their cook, when I was probably in eighth grade, maybe freshman in high school, somewhere along in there. Uh, my mom always loved to cook. And of course, having a whole bunch of kids. She had know, plenty of practice. Exactly, she got plenty of practice. And it's, in, in hindsight, I learned how to cook um, from my mom, just watching her. Because when I was growing up, I was, the part of my growing up that I remember most, I remember being the oldest girl at home. And since my mom worked out of the house, at the teak house, for example, I had to cook dinner. And I remember being in the fifth grade and having to prepare dinner for eight people in the fifth grade, well, because mom worked, somebody had to cook, dad got off work at 3.30 after he took a brief nap, when mom came home from work, somebody had to have dinner. Supper better be ready, that's huh? That's correct, and so we all kind of pitched in, but I remember learning how to cook from watching my mom cook and watching my older sisters cook. So nobody actually sat down and says, here's how you cook? Actually, my mom said, you can read, here's a cookbook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then you probably got some critique from some of the family members. You better members. believe it. You better believe it. But we all kind of helped. But then after my mom, um, I'm not sure what caused my mom to quit cooking because she was also the chef out at Giant City State Park Lodge. She did that for a number of years. And then even after she quit doing that, um, she would go out there when they would have special parties or you know things like that because my mom was an excellent cook and an excellent baker. Um, but she was always very interested and very active in community affairs, whether it be at the church or the neighborhood or whatever. And so toward the end of her life, maybe like in 1966, or somewhere along in there, the last four or five years of her life, she focused. Somehow or another, she got a job with the city. I have no clue how that happened, but she was hired by the mayor 
in the city of Carbondale to work on something called urban renewal. Oh, <laughs> about what time would this have been? That would have been in the 60s okay. somewhere, and um, where they were, they were going to improve the quality of life, get rid of all of the raggedy, broke-down houses in Carbondale. So this sounds like during the Johnson administration, it's probably 65 or after? somewhere along in there. Okay. And my mom was very active in moving that forward. And um, she, she went, for example, to a White House conference having to do with hunger in the late 60s, early 70s, when HUD, Housing and Urban Development, mm -hmm. was in its early days and the Great Society. Was that the name of it? Yeah, well, that was in one of the programs. Uh, under Johnson. The War on Poverty, the Great Society. All of those yeah. things. My mom took a very active um, front, front and center stage on speaking on behalf of the African American community in Carbondale. Okay. And so the last few years of her life, she passed away in uh, 1971. The last few years of her life were devoted to community activism and uh, trying to improve things mm -hmm. for the east side of Springfield, uh, east side of Carbondale, rather. Um, who would you say was the stronger influence on you growing up, your mother or your father? My mom, without a doubt. I think she was the. Uh, I think she was the strongest influence, in probably, for the older children because she was there and we have memories of her. Mm -hmm. Probably my sister who is right under me, the memories that Evelyn and us up in the birth order are real. I have gotten into discussions with my youngest sister. And she came along a lot later. A lot later, right. Um, my little sister Becky was eight. And she was born in 63? Something like that. I think that's what you wrote down. Something like that. Yes, she exactly. That would be right because she was eight when our mom died okay. in 1971. So some of the memories that she has of mom, I tend to question <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know if she can truly remember those. So for, for the older eight of us, it was mom. For my younger sister, for my youngest sister, I think dad would have been, you know, the strongest influence because dad basically raised her. Now, your mother passed away at 71, so you were still at home at the time? Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Um, was that unexpected? Yes, it was. In fact, I was supposed to go away to library school. It wasn't 71. It was 70. I was supposed to go away to library school in January of 1970, and my mom died in January of 1970, leaving Becky, Lily, Leland, Evelyn, and me, and Dad. And I could not see leaving my brothers and sisters in the middle of January after my mom had died thir 13 days before on January 2nd. So I stayed home and didn't go to library school until June. Yeah, I can't imagine how tough that was. Here you are facing one of your biggest changes in your life. For the first time, you're ready to go and leave home, mm -hmm. and then your mother dies unexpectedly. How did the family deal with that? <laughs> well, any time um, a parent dies, and my mom had really not been sick sick, uh, she suffered from hypertension and um, she had a heart condition, but her death was just very much unexpected. She passed out in the bathroom um, a couple of days after Christmas, and then she was in the hospital until she died. She told me and my dad that she wanted to see the new year come in. And she died like 2 o'clock in the morning on January 2nd. Wow. So it was a, it was awful, absolutely awful. 
the first dress that I bought in a store, new, was the dress I wore to my mom's funeral. Because my mom made all of the clothes for all of the girls in our family, from my oldest sister even to my little sister Becky. Now, when you were growing up, did you figure, well, that's just what everybody does? <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> I didn't know any better. We got secondhand clothes from the rummage sale. We got secondhand clothes from the homes of the wall of the when of the homes of the folks, you know, where my mom worked. Mm -hmm. They gave us things. But hey, in hind in, in hindsight and looking around, that's what everybody else did, you know. How would you describe your mother's personality? Forceful. <laughs> <laughs> Vigorous. I'm surprised. <laughs> she certainly let folks know what she thought. And I think the end result, toward the end of her life, you know, it paid off. Because I think the things that she did in the, in the community were certainly a benefit. My mom was always, this is tacky, tacky expression, my, my, or hackneyed expression, my mom was always there for us as children. She was, even though she was not at home, she was involved with us in school, in church, in my brother, for example, it was musical, uh, so she encouraged him, you know, to, uh, we couldn't afford lessons and stuff like that, but uh, she encouraged him, you go play the piano in church because it's free. I mean, you can practice, it's yeah. free. <laughs> you know? You're a long shot from having a <laughs> piano at home to practice on. And, but I do remember when we got a piano oh, okay. at home. That was a big to-do one Christmas. Um, <laughs> remember how old you were when that happened? I don't remember how old I was. I was probably, in, it was probably in my early teens. And mom had decided, Buffalo, uh, Bill, my brother, he needed to be able to practice his music at home. So mom made, an, mom went and made an arrangement <laughs> at the uh, local music store to have this piano delivered for Christmas. My dad was so angry. That's one of the very few times I remember my mom and dad really having an argument mm -hmm. was about the delivery of this piano, unbeknownst to my dad, oh. that <laughs> my mom had yeah, concocted. I can kind of understand why you <laughs> might be upset. <laughs> but nevertheless, we, we all lived through it. And, uh, and joke about it now. <laughs> absolutely, but it wasn't very funny at the time. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit more about your dad then. Um, my, His personality. My dad was a large, heavy set. I think he was attractive uh, man. He was soft spoken. Um, he was very active in his church. For a while, I remember my dad being a. Um, I don't know if you'd call it a deputy or not. I'm not quite a vol that's a volunteer policeman, if there is such a thing as that. I don't remember what they called him, but my dad had a gun. I remember seeing it in his bedroom and in his holster. And I guess I must have been sixth or seventh grade, somewhere along in there. I, I remember that. And his uh, one of his friends, Mr. Miller, who lived on Oak Street, which was the next street over from Green, he was one too, and I thought they were pretty cool. So obviously a man of distinction to have, a, have his own gun, huh? Absolutely. And then my dad was always interested in young folks. Uh, we had a uh, teen center. We called it the Rec, Recreation Center. And my dad was the supervisor of that. And so, Everybody in the neighbor, everybody in the community knew my mom and my dad, and dad knew all the kids because they would come to the teen center, mm -hmm. you know, to dance, play pool, play ping pong. Now, I'm curious, you didn't know much about what he was actually doing at work. Do you think he was ashamed of his work? Or he just didn't have the kind of, he didn't think that he needed to be talking about that at home. I just don't think he thought he needed to be talking about it. It was what he did, okay. it was what paid the bills, dad's mm -hmm. work. Okay. What was it that you mentioned uh, before 
that your parents were churchgoers, but they went to different churches. Yes, they did. My my dad went to um, Free Will Free Will Baptist Church. My mom went and us went to Bethel African Methodist Episcopal A and E Church. Now my mom's dad, my grandfather, who died the year a year after I was born, I think he died in 1948, so I had no memory of him, of course. He was an AME minister, so that certainly explains why my mom was mm -hmm. an AME. My grandmother, my dad's mom, was a Baptist, and so I'm sure that's why. However, my dad and, and my grandmother didn't go to the same church either. <laughs> my dad went to Free Will Baptist Church, and my grandmother went to uh, Hopewell Missionary Baptist Church. Now, whether there were differences in the doctrines of the free will versus the missionary Baptist, I have no idea. But I think that my mother, being the stronger of the two personalities <laughs> at home, you know, we went to the A&E church. Well, and it's certainly not uncommon that the kids go where mom goes to church. Uh, ab absolutely. But absolutely. I am struck that they're, they're both going to church and they're yeah. going to different churches. Mm -hmm. Uh, was that a doctrinal thing, or is that because your father was comfortable in that community that the church was? Yeah. Both? I think so. And, and certainly my, my mom being a PK, a preacher's kid, and raised in the AME church, you know, that just kind of followed naturally. The expectation was that she was supposed <coughs> to be an AME Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. But we would go, we meaning the children, we would go to my dad's church for Christmas programs, Easter programs, and the people at, at Free Will, they knew we were dad's kids, and so they kind of expected us to participate in the Christmas program, the Easter program, and those kinds of special programs they had, because they, they would have Sunday school at Free Will after our church service was over at the AME church. And sometimes we would go to Sunday school. It might be like one o'clock in the af in the afternoon, whereas most Sunday schools are at nine thirty in the morning. They had Sunday school at like one or one thirty. So sometimes we would go over there to go to Dad's service. But routinely, <coughs> all of us went to the AME church. And I remember when my when one of my older sisters married. She married a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> she started going to the what? Baptist church, and I remember my mom just, oh my God! <laughs> well, you know, her husband's been going to church, to the Baptist church, their entire marriage, and now she's upset that her daughter exactly. should go there too? Exactly. She thought my daughter, she thought that her daughter should just continue going to the AME church. But anyway, over time, I think my mom would chuckle now because even though my sister went to a Baptist church for many, many years. She has now returned to the fold uh -huh. of the AME church in Waukegan, and her husband continues to go to the Baptist oh. church. Okay. <laughs> life imitates life, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that would suggest that your mother had notions that were doctrinal in nation or about uh, why she wanted to stay in the AME right. church How, rather what, than the Baptist. What those things are, I have no yeah. idea. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit, uh, I know what I wanted to ask you about. Um, it strikes me also that uh, that black community in Carbondale was a pretty tight-knit group. Was that centered around the church? Oh, it, I, I'm certain that the role of the African-American church in my community was strong. Um, it was the, it and the school were probably the two most important institutions in our community. Those were the two things over which we had some control. And you were going to segregated grade school and junior high? Uh, yes, I did. Um, all of my brothers and sisters, from me up, went to Attucks Elementary School. My oldest sister, Georgetta, she went to University High School. 
and that's a story in and of itself, how that occurred. But Richard, Ovella, Nettie, they all went to Adams High School also. My brother, Bill Buffalo, he went to community, and I went to community high school, both as freshmen. Um, well, we need to hear that story, oh. don't we? Well, there are a couple of stories there to tell. Uh, one of the jobs that my mom had that I didn't mention was she was, well, I did say she was a domestic, but she was also a matron, just another fancy word, to being on the janitorial building staff at the Home Economics Department at SIU in Carbondale. And um, she became very good friends with the dean of the school. Her name was Eileen Quigley. That just came to me. Isn't that something? Yeah. <laughs> Her name was Eileen Quigley, and she was the dean. I mentioned, though, that my mom loved to sew. I don't know if she loved to, but she well, did. Well, she had plenty <laughs> practice, she at really least. had to do this. Um, and um, when my sister Georgetta was ready to go to high school, uh, now, I, I don't even know if I was born. I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, because I can't remember. I think my I sister think Georgetta graduated from high school probably in 52 or 53. Well, I think your, your oldest sibling was born in 37. Yes. And you came along 10 years later. Right. So, okay. Right. So anyway, when she went to, so that would put the time period where my mom worked at, for SIU Carbondale in the home ec department as a matron, as they called it. Somehow or another, doc, Dr. Quigley took a liking to my mom, and they got to be very friendly. And s she was responsible somehow for my sister going to university high school. Now, who went to university high school? Children of faculty members and staff at, S at Southern Illinois University. Have my mom. She's not considered staff being a matron there? Not in those days and times she wasn't. <laughs> It was a whole different world. And most of the folks who went to university high school, um, most of the students were were white, and they were students of faculty members. Now, this you say that this is Georgetta? Uh-huh. She was born 37, so this would have been mid-50s? Pro probably, and I think she graduated high school in 52 or 53. I'm not quite mm. for sure. Yeah. Somewhere mid fifties, yeah. And in her class, really there, before the civil rights movement absolutely. got started, it was prior to nineteen fifty four and, and okay. Brown versus okay. Board. I do remember that, um, which I didn't know about Brown versus Board <laughs> until years later, of course. Yeah. But, um, but there, there were there was one other black girl in my sister Georgetta's high school class, and her parents, I think her mom. She was also a, a domestic at the university in some department. But I always thought that was interesting that my oldest sister went to university high school um, at the time that she did. Mm -hmm. um, she was also on the synchronized swimming team. Oh, uh, wow. Which was, which I didn't was even always know a they, big joke in our family. I didn't even know they had that. Well, back they there. did, and my sister was on the synchronized swim team. We just had a big chuckle of that. Well, that was during the Esther Williams craze, you know, all Absolutely, those absolutely. It, it certainly was, so. Um, how did I, oh, so that's how my sister got there. Then Richard, Ovella, and Nettie, they all graduated from Adams High School, which was, quote, the black school. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother Bill, because of his interest in music, which he had had for, you know, as a child, and it came time to go to high school. My mom said that the music department at Carbondale Community High School, CCHS, was better than the music department at Atux. And if he was serious about his music, then he should go to community. So he did. He probably had. She, uh, she arranged for that to happen then? Uh, so to speak. This is where you will go. <laughs> <laughs> that was the arrangement. It wasn't that black, could, black kids couldn't go to CCHS at that time. It was a question of choice. People go to where they are most comfortable. Right. And okay. so that's how that came to pass. So Buffalo bit the bullet, and he went over there to community high school. 
well, there were very few black kids in his graduating class. This begs the question. Uh -huh. How does Buffalo Bill become Buffalo Bill as oh. a, you know, a musician, no less? <laughs> I don't know if those two things go together. Uh, Buffalo was a name, a nickname that I gave to my brother after he graduated college. One of his first teaching jobs was in Nebraska. Oh. <laughs> so does the rest of the family call him Buffalo? Other people in the family have you know, years later, have started to call him Buffalo. Well, it's a colorful moniker. And I call him Buffalo, and when I call him Bill, he thinks I'm mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> so. And William probably even madder. <laughs> so, anyhow. So, he went to CCHS because of his interest in music. And when he was in, in high school, he played the tuba in the marching band. And when he majored in music in college, uh, the tuba was his primary instrument or whatever you call it. And then he also, uh, when he was in college, he was a music major. He learned how to play every instrument in the, in the orchestra. Um, and his, his other instrument in which he's very proficient is an upright bass. Okay. So he very music, he's very musically inclined. I think he got all of the musical <laughs> talent. He got every musical gene. Is that what he's doing then for a living? That is what he did. He is now a retired uh, music teacher. Oh, okay. But Excellent. he is the uh, conductor of the um, Ypsilanti Youth Symphony Orchestra in Ypsilanti, Michigan. He, yeah. also, he even taught at Interlochen. Oh, really? Yes. He's, he's, my brother is really very talented. I hate his guts. <laughs> <laughs> he can play the piano. He can play any instrument. I mean, he just really is. He got... If you know if there was a gene pool of musical talent, it all got plopped. Does together. he have a voice to go along with all that musical talent? Not that you want to hear him sing. Okay. <laughs> no. What were some of the values that your parents taught you? Taught all of your brothers and sisters? <clears throat> well, honesty, integrity, speaking up for what you believe. Um, um, certainly because we were raised in the church, our family is spiritual, um, religious, um, trustworthy, hopeful, if that's a, a value, you know. What were your expectations and their expectations for all of you? Their expectations for all of us were to do better than what they had done. Neither my mom nor my dad went to college. They did both finish high school. <laughs> but neither well, of them... At that day and age, that was quite an accomplishment, I would think. Oh, to finish high school? Heavens, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, it was. Um, for many years, um, my dad would go to his high school, graduate, uh, high, high school reunions that they would have in Carbondale for the folks who went to Adtuck School. Um, they still have an Atux reunion that covers all of the years because the high school pros, that's the story I never did tell you mm. about how I went to CCHS as opposed to Atux High School. In 1961, which is when I started high school, <coughs> the decision had already been made that Atux High School would close in 1964. That would be the year before I was to graduate. I graduated in 1965. My mother. This was because of desegregation issues at yes. the time? Yes. My mother said to me, well, they're going to close Attucks in 1965. So that'll be the year you'll graduate. You may as well go over there with those white people right now. In 1961 so I did and that's why I started high school at CCHS because she thought it would be stupid to go three years to a school knowing it's gonna close and you would not mm -hmm. graduate from there so why why do that so there were probably um, only about a handful of black students at CCHS in 1961. 
CCHS did indeed close in 1964. And those students with whom I had gone to elementary school up to the eighth grade then joined me as members of the senior class for 1965. And a lot different feel, I would think, for that senior year. It was. It was different. I, I, I was I was wanting to in the second half of this talk a little bit more about high school years. I, if you would, I'd like to go back and ask a couple questions about the earlier time, earlier childhood. Do you recall any specific incident where it really became apparent to you that you were different from a lot of the other people in Carbondale? I well, I'll give you one story that I that I do truly remember. Um, one day we were going to or coming from, I'm not sure, the public library, which was on the other side of town. You had to cross the tracks to get Ooh. there. And um, there was a Rexall, oh boy, that goes back a while, a Rexall drugstore that had a soda fountain. And I guess we must have had a quarter or 50 cents or, or something. And we decided we wanted to stop and have a Coke. And there was also a Hub Cafe, that was the name of it, on the corner. And um, so we, meaning my, I guess it must have been my sisters and my brother Bill, we decided we'd stop to get ice cream or soda or whatever. And we did stop. We stopped at the Rexall Drugstore and we got our ice cream, but we couldn't sit down. We had to just continue on. And you knew you couldn't sit down or you were wondering how come we can't sit down? Actually we knew we, no one ever did. No one ever, black that is. The fountain was right there. So it's one of those things you grew up with and you just, there were just okay? just things that you knew and that was something that you knew. We well, couldn't sit in Rexall at the fountain and you couldn't eat at the counter or in the booth at the Hub Cafe. I don't remember when that changed, nor who did it, but one day, you could. <laughs> you, it, just, it just changed. I don't remember any protest, signs, marching, or anything of that nature. Neither could we sit on the main level at the Varsity Theater. We meaning people of color. Now, the Varsity Theater is the one that's downtown, still downtown, I think. I'm not sure if it's still op open, but yes, the building is certainly yeah. still there. I, I went to a theater right downtown when mm -hmm. I was there for a swim meet for my daughter not too many years ago. So. Well, then I guess it's still there. Right, it is downtown. Okay. Um, there was a time that we had to sit in the balcony. You know, I never thought about those things because that was just the way it was. So you didn't feel any really overt racism? I didn't. And maybe I was so naive, I didn't know. No, you you knew nothing to compare it with, perhaps. Correct. I suppose I really did not have a full realization of to look at things like that until the 60s when you started seeing what was going de going on in the South mm -hmm. because it was on the national news. So did you have a TV growing I up? I remember the day we got <laughs> our TV. We thought we were big stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the Hayes have arrived. Huh? Absolutely, absolutely. And I remember my dad watching boxing matches uh, on TV. I remember people coming over to the house on Friday nights uh, you know, like our next door neighbor who didn't have a TV yet. Was this the 50s then? Yes, it was probably, it was before one of my sisters. I have a sister who was born in like 53 or 54, somewhere along in there. Evelyn was born in 53, okay. you've got. Okay, well it was probably a year, be so, a year or so before that, that we got a TV. So you were that just a little stuff. tyke at the time. That was big stuff, but I remember because I remember the test patterns that would be on the TV. <laughs> yeah, those days are behind us. Oh, you know, there was no 24-7 infomercials and all of well, that. 
how many channels Saluting did you get? Saluting the flag, you know, because it, that was the sign off and the flag flying. Well, I guess it was probably maybe two. Ooh, okay. Maybe two. Carbondale and Marion, maybe? Pro no, it wasn't Carbondale because we didn't have a TV station in Carbondale for a few years later. We had Harrisburg. Okay. And there was another because there was a CBS affiliate. I think Harrisburg was in maybe an ABC affiliate. Because mm -hmm. I remember Walter Cronkite <laughs> yeah. and the news. The and St. Louis was probably too far away to pull in station. Probably so. Probably so. So what was, I do remember. What was it like uh, having holidays in such a large family? <laughs> <laughs> And apparently your grandparents were still in the, in the area as well. My grandmother, uh, my paternal grandmother. Okay. Um, in fact, she lived in Carbondale. My maternal grandmother lived in Carbondale too, but neither of them lived with us until close to the end mm -hmm. of their lives. Um, my maternal grandmother passed away in our house. Interestingly enough, in the bedroom where the girls slept. So I'm trying to remember where the hell did we sleep <laughs> when my grandmother was in the room dying. Yeah. I don't, I truly don't remember. I just don't remember. Would the parents have arranged for you to sleep in another house or? No, I, I no, we probably had a pull out bed and slept on the couch. Yeah. That's probably what we did. I truly can't remember that. Anyway, Thanksgivings, Easter's, Christmases. Ah, my mom sewed her tail off. We all got new dresses. Every one of us got a new dress for Easter and a new outfit for Christmas. A Sunday going to church a dress? A Sunday going to church meeting dress. Uh, we, she might be hemming them as we're going out the door <laughs> to go to Sunday school, but everybody got new, new togs for Christmas and Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas and Easter. Uh, my mom even made coats for us. Oh, wow. And she made coats for us. Um, and she I was a very good seamstress. Oh, excellent, excellent. She made coats for us out of blankets, uh, wool blankets, mm -hmm. and she would line them and everything. Oh. Uh, I guess because maybe blankets were cheaper than wool by the yard off of a selvage. You know. Well, I'm trying to uh, picture what it's like sitting around the Thanksgiving table or the Christmas table eating dinner as well. Oh, my goodness. And then my mom loved to cook. So at Thanksgiving, uh, we would have a, you know, a 20 pound turkey or whatever, maybe more. And we had our dining room table. And then we also had the little table <laughs> <laughs> where the younger folks um, would eat. Because I remember um, that at Thanksgiving, my older brothers and sisters who had since left home, because like I said, I was in the fifth grade when I started cooking for the yeah. family. So those older brothers and sisters who had left home, got married, we all came home at Thanksgiving. And we continue that tradition today. Thanksgiving is the time that all the family members get back together. So you weren't the main cook for the Thanksgiving and Christmas meals, but you were in there helping? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we had the main dining room table, we had a little table, and we had card tables set up. And I remember having, you know, 20 some odd people at dinner, on Thanksgiving dinner, in a room that was probably only half the size of this one. <laughs> I would imagine it's even smaller than half the size. <laughs> probably so, probably so. But now, and um, my mom said to my sister, who my oldest sister, who came home for Christmas, the first year she was married, she came home for Christmas, and, my, and she'd just been there, you know, the previous month for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. She said, um, you start your own Christmas traditions. Christmas is a time for you and your family. Yeah. So you start your own Christmas tradition with your family. But you better have your butt here at Thanksgiving. <laughs> 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 and 
And so we continue that tradition now. And now when we have Thanksgiving um, for the family, for example, last year we had 62 people at Thanksgiving dinner. It was no longer at anyone's house because we have out outgrown that. But that's just brothers, sisters, their children, you know, my, my nephews and nieces. And in some instances now I have great, great nephews. Mm -hmm. So when you started these meals, did uh, Dad start off with the prayer then? Of course. Of course. And he also carved the turkey. <laughs> so very traditional. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And the same, you know, at, at Christmas. And at Christmas, um, we spend a lot of time on the telephone um, talking to one another because we are not together yeah. on Christmas Day. And that was something my mom, that's just how we operate in our family, our family. So time. managed to stay very tight knit. Mm -hmm. But we have big telephone bills on Christmas Day. It's a fair trade off though, it sounds like. Absolutely. I talk to all of my brothers and sisters on Christmas Day. I think this is probably a good time to take a break okay. and then we'll come back and talk about your high school years. Oh.